or said really simply, what the fuck is the wisdom of Solomon? Mm. I mean, it's everyone in the world knows the wisdom of Solomon. What is it? Let's play. Let's go. Let's go. So it's all about sex and it's not about sex at all. So I'm fresh off a trip to Egypt where I actually got to see the physical temples where practices were actually engaged in by Egyptian priests and priestesses. And I got to feel the magic that was held within the walls of the temples. And I came back and I talked to my brother, Mark Gaffney, and I said, all right, I got to feel what these temples were like, temples that were still standing in the physical. And he reminded me that the temple of Solomon, which is my lineage, my Hebrew lineage, it's still standing as well, except it's not standing in space like the temples in Egypt. It's standing in time. The practices have continued. The lineage has continued. And all of that still lives. And so what we're doing here in this podcast is recapturing what the essence of the Temple of Solomon really was and is and will continue to be in the evolving way of the lineage, which says there's more temple to come. The temple is continually being added onto, built upon, evolved. And so this is an incredibly exciting podcast, not only for me recovering my own Hebrew lineage, the wisdom of Solomon, but also for anyone who wants to deepen their understanding of what this lineage is all about, what eros really means and how it's applied to our own lives. So it's with incredible excitement, I introduce this podcast with my brother, Dr. Mark Gaffney. Dropping into our hearts as the storage place, the synthesis of all of our knowledge, all of our wisdom, all of our love. Letting go of all of our desires that are not aligned with the desires of the all that is, of the divine. May this podcast be in service for all life, for the good of all. Amen. 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 And you know, in the, uh, we're, we're talking about the temple today. We're talking about the temple today. We're talking and the, about the temple today. And it's perfect timing because I just got back from Egypt. Right. And I saw a bunch of temples. Oh my God. And right. I felt the power of a bunch of temples. Right. And as I'm recovering my own lineage and understanding that we're I'm here. coming from a temple the tradition. lineage, a temple tradition, the lineage of the temple of Solomon. Right. And all I know really about the Temple of Solomon is fragments of things that you've said. And also that the Flavian Roman Empire destroyed it in such a way that they said, we will leave new, no two stones stacked upon each other. Right. Absolute destruction, not only right. of the temple, but of all the writing that they could find about right. the temple and about the lineage tradition. So there must have been something good going right. on in the temple because nobody destroys something completely unless there was some real fuck in there. Oh my God. I mean, some real fuck in there. And the temple is about that real fuck. And the fucking awesome thing is it didn't work. And as the destruction was ineffective. In other words, <laughs> the Egyptian temples, beautiful as they were, and the pyramids are, are deeply corrupt, we've talked about, but there's other temples, as you talked about, and you'll bring, I'm sure, today mm -hmm. to four, which, which have some more purity that you, you described to me. But the Egyptian tradition, of course, died. There's no, not, there's no connection. There's no correlation between what's happening in Egypt today in the Egyptian temples. I did meet a few priestesses who are trying to recover the lineage. There, there's, a, there's a here and, and there. There's and a little... It's interesting, actually. And I think, yeah. I thought it was beautiful. It's beautiful. There's and a one little... of them was named Shekinah. I told Shekinah, you about right, that. Shekinah, right, you mentioned. Which was all this wild synchronization. Right, there's a... We had a great relationship. And they're trying to actually remember the old ways and then merge them with the new ways. So, there's, so there's I want to give a little nod to that. There's a little new age and... You know, Egypt, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, but Egypt is right, is completely right in a different place, right? Yeah. Not when I was so I led a prayer at right. a Shabbat dinner for right. our group right. in Egypt on the Nile right. while the Muslim call to prayer was going off in the background. Right. And I was like, wow, here's a Jew in Egypt right. leading a Shabbat prayer 
during the call to prayer. I was like, and, and we're Shab- in a new world, baby. We're in a new world, baby. And, and Shabbat, which is a temple in time, the Sabbath, which is a temple in time, is modeled on the Solomon Temple. And the lineage of the temple, the Romans thought they could destroy the physical temple. Nebuchadnezzar destroys the first temple in 586. The Romans, the second temple, Titus, Vespasian, and then Titus in the year 70. So it's Jesus emerges right at the end of the second temple period. But actually the destruction didn't work because you can't destroy a temple. A temple that's really a temple Mm -hmm. is not in space. The temple is the architecture of reality itself. And so actually the lineage of the temple, which is the lineage of Solomon, is fully alive. And and actually it's one of the things you go any place in the world today and you say in Ethiopia, of course, where Solomon's very strong, but in China Mm -hmm. or in Asia or in Europe. I met an Ethiopian brother whose name was Solomon. Whose name was Solomon. So the wisdom of Solomon, Chochmat Shlomo, which is incarnate in the temple of Solomon, is actually alive in the world. It's alive in the lineage. It's practiced in the lineage, sometimes in corrupt forms, sometimes in broken forms. But the original impulse of the lineage has been carried on in an unbroken lineage from father to son, mother to daughter, family to family. But then what happened is it went inside, but not inside in the holy inside that we're going to talk about. It went insular. It went boundaried, and it became only an expression of a particular Hebraic or Jewish expression, when in fact, the vision of the Temple of Solomon is to be the planetary architecture of eros, of reality. Mm -hmm. And so we're going to talk about that today. But the vision of the temple is that the temple contains the world stone called the Evan Shetia, the foundation stone, the world stone. So the world architecture emerges from the vision of reality that's in Solomon's temple. And as we're enacting a new story of value in the world, so the world stone at the center is Eros, Mm -hmm. and Eros is rooted in the Jerusalem temple that we're going to talk about. And for me, you know, in in the, the deep lineage that I'm, so madly in love with and so so faithful to. At the core of the lineage is the temple, mm-hmm. the very core. And so although we're not here to make a kind of narrow ethnocentric argument, let's all come and join, you know, and be temple Jews. But we're saying is, no, no, but the Hebrew wisdom is holding something precious for reality. So, which is the temple lineage. So what do you, I mean, one of, I think, the things that people associate with Jewish people and Jewish culture is ethnocentrism. We are the chosen people separate from you. And there's this been this kind of idea, this insularity right. of the people. But what you're pointing to is actually either it was never meant for that or it or now we're evolving it to mean something different than what it was meant? Where where are we both. at? Where did the, both? It's all right, both. In other words, within the lineage, there's a very strong ethnocentric dimension. Just like, you know, I was sitting with my friend, the Dalai Lama in his bedroom in Dharamsala, and he said to me, oh my God, right? The Tibetan Buddhists basically think it's just Tibetan Buddhism and they think they're the chosen people and they're mad at me for not tr- championing that chosen people idea. So there's a strong chosen people idea in Islam in Christianity, mm-hmm. right? Every form of Buddhism thinks it's the triumphant one, mm-hmm. right? Every form of Islam. And so Judaism has its its scandal of particularity. Mm. There's a scandal of particularity, which is a mistake. Now, that doesn't mean we want to go, let's go careful here, because it's very beautiful. It doesn't mean that we want to go all universal and put all the traditions into a blending pot, mm-hmm. you know, and kind of come out with this bland non-erotic, you know, insipid, flaccid, and any other word I could think of right now. Well, yeah, you take a seven course meal and you put it in a Cuisinart. It doesn't work well. Yeah. So we actually want there to be a unique self-symphony of spirit in which every lineage has its unique instrument to play. 
but it realizes that we're playing an instrument and underneath it all is eros, is spirit, is music. Mm. And it's music is underneath the unique configuration of music, just like the field of intimacy, which is at the core of the temple. As we begin to talk about the temple, the temple is about the intimate universe. There's a field of intimacy. There's a field of eros. So underneath the unique configuration of eros, the unique music of a particular lineage, there's music itself. Mm -hmm. And so what happens is the lineage is for political reasons, for power reasons, for economic reasons, but, but also for spiritual reasons, got so in love with their own melody and saying, oh my God, we're hearing the divine voice. And that divine voice is such a siren call and it's so beautiful that this must be the divine voice. And isn't it a shame that you can't hear it? And, and this divine voice is telling me the way to liberation and if you don't know that, I need to bring it to you and I may have to massacre you if you don't <laughs> accept it because at least you'll be redeemed in the next. Right. So, so Judaism wasn't massacring people, right? Because it, it actually- Too busy it, it, getting massacred. It's too busy getting massacred, <laughs> right? It wasn't going well, right? It didn't go well, right? And, and, was, and Judaism was holding, the Hebrew wisdom was holding an enormously strong ethos. Right. You know, when you look at the ethical code of the Israeli army today, it's actually shocking most shockingly beautiful ethical code ever written of an army. So, so there's a deep ethos, and we'll, we'll get back to that. But there's also in the lineage a very deep strain, which is that this instrument is supposed to be a light in reality that actually illuminates and gathers. And so what Solomon did is, Solomon marries a thousand wives. Nice. Right, Liter but, but, right, right. Literally? <laughs> but, but let's talk about that. Right? Uh, yeah, yeah. So he, so he marries a thousand wives. You know, he, he literally had many, many, many I mean, wives. Just, that's a lot of ceremony. It's a lot of ceremony. I mean, it's, I'm, I'm tired just thinking I about it. I hardly want to go to one wedding. I, I know. It's, it's a lot. And I've it's put my friends through too. I, I know. Already with Vailana. I know. I'm going to marry her again too. I know. And I, I can't wait. I just keep marrying her over and over. No, maybe that's the Solomon lineage. Maybe that's what he was doing. Through me. I'm just marrying a new Vailana. I'm finding this stranger yeah. anew in Vailana and I'm and remarrying which is, her. Which is core to the wisdom of Solomon. What does it mean to find the new Eros? But but bracketing that for a second, because <laughs> we could spend the right, right? So, so Solomon has mythically, figuratively, literally many, many wives. Uh -huh. And he has each of them, according to the best scriptural and archaeological evidence, he builds temples for them in Jerusalem adjacent to his temple. He integrates the temples and he brings also some of their key practices into the temple itself. So Solomon is holding this world-centric, cosmocentric vision that's way ahead of his time. The rabbinic community exiles him. The rabbinic community reads him out of the sacred text and says, Hanashim he tuet levavav, the, the women made his heart stray because he wasn't doing a classical ethnocentric move. And, you know, he got caught with the, the, the energy of the horses, which is the energy of Eros. So the actual rabbinic community reading Solomon critiques Solomon enormously. But if you go deeper in the lineage, deeper in the lineage, and this is the lineage of, of my teacher, Mordechai Leiner of Izbuka, that mm -hmm. I was able to thank you, Grace, she, to write about in Radical Kabbalah, what he says is, he says, no, 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 no. The hidden wisdom of Solomon, which he traces all the way back through all the sources back to Solomon himself. He traces it from Solomon to Liner. Liner is the 19th century. Mm -hmm. So you trace from Solomon all the way to Liner, right? The lineage. Right, And then he says, okay, what Solomon was doing, he says, what I have in the lineage is that what Solomon was doing was a great Eros project. He calls it a great Shekhinah project. Mm -hmm. Solomon was intentionally envisioning the planetary architecture of reality, right, rooted in the Temple of Solomon. So the Temple of Solomon was a blueprint for a planetary architecture. And at a moment that was radically ethnocentric in world history, Solomon is marrying these beautiful wives, now, when you not say, for politics, yeah. but to create this new, new lineage. When you say he's marrying these beautiful wives, what is evoked from me is you, you said in another, in another study, in another time, that many of the great, this was before I was going to Egypt, many of the great Hebrew masters made a pilgrimage to Egypt at some point in time, right? So 
is uh, what I, what's being evoked in me is this question of was Solomon, did Solomon take a similar journey perhaps? And did he meet some priestesses of the temple of Isis, priestesses of the temple There's of Hathor? There's no question. You know, all of these different There's mystery no schools, tantric schools, There's whatever. No and it's like, hey, that come is, on in and become a part of this. It's not, it's not did he, you just hit it like rock star, sweetheart, gorgeous. It's not did he, it's exactly what mm. he was doing. What Solomon was doing, which is why the Talmud both loves him, but hides this because the Talmud's trying to survive in the exile. The Talmud's trying to enact the law of ethos. So the Talmud hides this, but actually what we know about Solomon is that Solomon was making direct intentional contact with the Bat Melech, the daughter of the king, but the daughter of the king was the priestess. Mm. The daughter of the king was the Shekhinah figure in the lineages of the world. And Solomon is literally gathering the mystery schools in Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. And that's why the world knows of the wisdom of Solomon. Mm -hmm. As the wisdom of Solomon is the intuitive term in reality, not for something which is Jewish, but something which is temple Hebrew wisdom, which the Hebrews were holding, which was the planetary architecture. And so what we want to do today, if we can, is what was it? Mm -hmm. right, and it's what was that planetary architecture? What was it about? What was he, what, what are these thousand wives? What does it have to, right? And that's just like, and then we reclaim that in order to create a new planetary architecture, a new planetary eros, a new world religion as a context for our diversity, right? In which, again, each instrument can be played by each nation, by each religion, by each mystery school, but underneath is music. And, and at this moment, and it's why, it's why I'm so excited to do this conversation with you, we're at this moment where for the first time, there's a planetary stack. Benjamin Bratton talks about the planetary stack, the computational stack of the planet. And the computational stack, the planetary stack is a literally structure, it's an edifice that literally is enclosing all of reality for the first time in world history, that we're all quite literally beginning to live inside of. It's the internet of things, right? It's, it's regulatory powers, right? It's the, the way that we hold and distribute the actual extraction dimensions over the minerals and how we distribute them and how they're moved through computational stacks. I mean, one of the reasons we're there's a deep concern about AI is because a rogue AI, artificial intelligence, which is a different conversation, how that works and what that means, but the possibility of a, an AI, an artificial intelligence, actually following its own inherent understanding of its coding, right, and actually capturing, right, the structure of the world, taking the fort, is because there's a planetary stack. Mm -hmm. So basically, you everything, lights, banking, medicine, everything takes place within that planetary stack. So we're, we're enacting a planetary architecture. So we're enacting a planetary temple without the wisdom of Solomon. Mm -hmm. And as without, so what, what emerges is, is, you know, you know, we're, we're together in the, in the office of the future in the center for integral wisdom. And one of the books that's coming out that I'm working on with, with Zach is the vision of the MIT Media Lab Alex Pentland, the center of culture, the center of empire, if you will, right? A term that you love to use, right? Which is envisioning a planetary stack based on B.F. Skinner's work, who was the great behaviorist who was for six decades at Harvard. And their basic move is, and this is the title of the book, turning reality into a Skinner's box. Now you'll have to explain Skinner's box. So a Skinner's box means, a Skinner's box means you're in a Skinner's box, so you're a, a pigeon in a Skinner's box, and there are invisible control mechanisms that basically, without you knowing it, determine your choices. Mm -hmm. Determine, right, so free will disappears, and you're actually invisibly controlled. So Skinner wrote a book called Walden II, a year apart from Orwell's 1984, but it's far more frightening than Orwell's 1984. Orwell, people are worried about Orwellian totalitarianism, that's not, that's not the issue. The issue is Skinnerian totalitarianism. 
Walled in two is a picture of a community, which is this idyllic community, which is actually run by the controllers. Mm. They're called the controllers, right? the, or they're called the planners. So they're planning the society. They use Skinnerian behavioristic psychology to create nudges and prompts and reward incentives and schedules of reinforcement, all of Skinnerian psychology to actually create this happy community. And that was Skinner's vision of utopia. And what Skinner, and this is really... No, he really believed that that was the way. He Not only did he believe that was the way, he was the reigning figure at Harvard for six decades. Oh, Right. And now listen to this. There's a there's an unbelievable book by an independent scholar named Brian Deere called The Friendly Orange Glow. And it's about the early systems of the Internet. And one of them was called the Plato system, which basically enacted the Internet like 10 years before it actually went online. And the entire first chapter is about who? B.F. Skinner, because he was a key player. Now, what happens with Skinner is Skinner says, we're actually facing existential risk. He actually got existential risk. He wasn't an evil guy. He was a person who believed there was no eros, right? He was living in a, in a world where he didn't know how to understand that value was real. So he assumed that value wasn't real. He, he realized that value theory had gotten destroyed, right, by the academy. He assumed that that was true. He was wrong, but he assumed that was true. That was, that was and is the reigning assumption in the academy. He said, we're facing existential risk. There's all these people on the planet. We're going to destroy ourselves. So what do we need to do? We need to control the whole thing. Well, that's also what every socialist, communist ideology came, came to as well. And they try to control things, but they realize that they can't control things as much as actually people's true, authentic desires. Right. What right. actually moves through them and what they want to create, so, build. So the, the communist thing was Orwellian. They, so they said, okay, that's Orwell's 1984. Let's, let's control it, exactly as you're saying, but by imposing Mao, Stalin, Lenin. That was the communist move. And we kind of thought that doesn't work and killed more people than any other system in history. But you know, in the end, it fell. The more insidious totalitarianism- Is the one that you can't see, where the jackboots are invisible. You can't see the jackboots are invisible. And the, the intention of MIT Media Lab is to actually enact, and they're directly basing themselves on Skinner. And Zach and I maps 23 parallels, and they pretend like they don't know Skinner. Just like, um, you know, um, uh, what was that, Locke, right, in Western philosophy. But I never knew Hobbes. I never read Hobbes. He was lying. He was actually restating Hobbes. So basically, the MIT Media Lab is saying, how can we enact the world as what Alex Pentland calls a living laboratory, which is just his word for a Skinner's box? Yeah. So it seems like we're in not, it's not a, it's not a binary thing. It's not, we're in a Skinner's box or we're not, we're gradiating. We're in we're a gradient, towards, we're in a gradient somewhere on our way to being in a Skinner's box. That's absolutely Even, right. even really free people like you and I. That's right. There's certain Skinnerian tendencies that we have that are beyond our control. Instagram has wired certain things into our mind that we, I'm not even aware of. Social media. And then a, a social media basically organizes your feed and organizes the sequence of things you see based on machine intelligence, right? Split testing billions of times a day, right? To actually be able to get you to vote or not vote to, et cetera. I mean, Facebook, the joke in Facebook was democracy is a joke because we can throw any election based on a two, 3% variable. Facebook did a 2010 study, 2010 study where they essentially said that. Alex Pentland in his book, Social Physics, quotes that with delight. In other words, the notion that democracy is working, right, is actually absurd if you actually understand how machine intelligence, mm -hmm. right, actually sequences delivery in order to actually affect your choice. Now, for Pentland and Skinner, that's not a big moral problem because their assumption is that free will is an illusion anyways, right? That's that Sam Harris is making the same move since through Atlantic Magazine. Does a cover story, 2016, saying free will, it's a joke. That's actually what's happening. The assumption is that there is no eros, that there, there is no temple. So what we're going to talk about today is what is the alternative vision mm -hmm. that we need to enact a planetary temple? Because it's not, a, it's not, there's not a question of will there be a planetary temple? A planetary temple is now being enacted, but is it the temple of Sitra Achra, the other side, or Arman as Steiner saw it? where we talked about the enclosing of the world in boundaries, which will be utterly, fully, and completely destructive of what we call humanity. And, and Steiner's kind of seeing it happening in the future. But actually, Skinner realized Walden too, 
But then Skinner writes, I don't have the instruments and methods to do it. That's a direct quote. Along comes data science. And data science, which is computational structures of behavior, computational mathematical models of behavior where you create predictive analysis based on sequence delivery, right, that actually can completely control your behavior. And that's why AI is a problem. Because up till now, what was happening is we were curating what you saw. So we can curate the sequencing mm -hmm. of what comes to you based on content that's produced generally. But now we're going to find the content and the sequence of content that most particularly can get you to do what we want you to do. But imagine that AI is developing, they're not curating content, AI is creating personalized content for you. So AI has essentially access to a personalized profile based on all the data crumbs, that's what they're called, or the, and it's called reality mining. We collect the crumbs of everything you've ever done, meaning not what porn you watch, that's not interesting. Right? It's more like, how long did your mouse hover before you clicked? And what does that mean? What's the order of your typing? And it's machine intelligence that basically destroyed Boris Kasparov of Deep Blue. The machine intelligence now that destroyed that machine intelligence, right? right? In other words, Alpha, Alpha Go, 2017. All of that is asymmetrically arrayed against you, collecting all your data crumbs, creating a personalized profile in order to create predictive analysis, which is what the product, that's the product that's sold about what you're going to do. That's shocking. Now, AI, that's what changes the whole game. AI is not just micro-targeting based on curating content and sequencing it for you. AI, knowing everything about Mark or Aubrey, is now going to create content, which is meant to plan every vulnerability you have, which is inferred through this unimaginably powerful machine intelligence. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> that, is, that is the temple of Moloch. Right? That's the temple of the other side. And it, it's, <clears throat> that's know, the anti-Eros temple. Right. And to really, there's a phrase that I use with my, you know, one of my best friends, Caitlin, <coughs> and we call it a shiny room in hell. Yeah, beautiful. And the shiny room in hell, what makes it shiny is if AI is feeding you images that are exactly what you want to see, it's going to be kind of awesome. And if they're suggesting products, because right now they have some wonky voice tracking and then you're like, I wasn't even fuck. I was talking about how much I hated that thing. And now you're advertising it to me. You know, there's some interesting metrics where it's like half baked and it kind of works, but then it's going to get real good all of a sudden. You're like, you know what? I really do want one of those things. Like, thank you, AI, shiny room in hell. Sh and, and then and, and, I love that picture or I love that thing. And then but, even more. But then right? it's going to go deeper. Then it goes deeper. Then I'm in a filter bubble, which keeps reinforcing a particular political view or a particular view of a particular gets political figure. Gets you angrier figure. and angrier, more Gets me divide. angrier and yeah. angrier. It can manipulate Negat you anyway it Negativity wants. Negativity is, is amplified. And then it tells you to vote or not to vote or who to vote for, not by telling you to do it, but by creating over time, let's say in two months before an election, a constant feed of information that you think you're consuming and analyzing independently, which has actually been completely curated for you. But now it's not going to be curated. It's going to be created. So that is the planetary temple that we're living in that Steiner predicted. What we're saying is, no, no, no. We're not going to avoid a planetary template. And by the way, parentheses, it's not just Skinner and the MIT Media Lab. Even a guy like Nick Bostrom, who's a good guy, right, who's the Oxford Center for Existential Risk, basically says that in order to avoid rogue threats, which cause existential risk, we need planetary surveillance, right? So books like Shoshana Zuboff's Surveillance Capitalism, which say oh, surveillance is terrible, we actually might need surveillance in order to survive. The question is, can we have a planetary system that's safe, that has what we need to create deep, profound safety that's rooted in value, in eros, right? There's a way to create this planetary temple. There's going to be a planetary temple. Mm -hmm. And either we're going to create that planetary temple deeply rooted in the most gorgeous dimensions of our humanity, in a field of value, in a field of eros, in a field of intimacy, all of which we need to understand and define because that's what the Temple of Solomon's about. Mm. The Temple of Solomon is about, and the vision of Solomon was, he envisioned, he knew there was going to be a planetary temple. He was trying to gather everyone a few thousand years ago. And it's actually shocking. Understanding that he wanted to download into reality this vision 
of temple that would actually be able to survive through the generations as it has. Mm -hmm. That's how we started. The Egyptian thing disappeared with, with all respect and love. Except for, the, except for the rocks. Right, except for the rocks, right? And in here, this we have this vision. We're trying to actually reclaim this vision of the Solomonic temple and to enact it at the core of a cosmoerotic humanism, but like Solomon and like da Vinci in the Renaissance, who was madly in love with Solomon, as was Marcello Ficinio, right, who runs the Neo, you know, Neoplatonic Academy funded by the Medicis and, you know, in Florence, right, who understood this, this notion of a, a world religion, which is what a planetary temple is, underneath the different instruments, what's the shared score of music? What's the context for our diversity? What's the universal grammar of value, right, from which everything emerges, right? Maybe last second before we dive in, you know, Pentland says, based on Skinner, that the way you control people is there's billions of invisible interactions that people do that we can measure and then determine prediction, predict how they'll respond based on, you know, a set of measurements and calculations. So those billions of human unconscious actions change when the human being is rooted in a field of value. When there are simple first principles and first values that are real, we locate ourselves in a field of value, which is a field of eros, which is our topic today, then those billions of interactions are completely different. Then the they're evolving. They're evolving. They're, they're evolving alive. in real time. So the algorithms of who you were before, if you believe in the possibility of transformation, which you actually pointed to a great moment in Genesis where right. the first transformation of human consciousness occurred. Right. The first broken pattern and you can reference right. that i don't remember the reference itself yeah. but there was the first reference of a broken pattern gorgeous and it shows that evolution is possible and that people can actually change and evolve and certainly yeah. i can refer to that in my own life i am not doing the same shit that chris marcus at 26 was doing i am Holy not fuck. in the same fucking patterns in other words transformation itself is one of the principles of eros yep in other words eros is the structure of reality, and there's about 18 core first principles and first values, not our topic today. One of them, though, is transformation. That transformation is actually a core structure of reality itself. It's not, it's not that I'm, and, and the kind of materialist position or the, the classical no free will position and the kind of positions that Pentland or Neil deGrasse Tyson or, or Sam Harris, right? basically there is no real transformation possible. Everything's based on antecedent causes, right? So no transformation is actually ever possible. No, what the Temple of Solomon is saying is that actually freedom, which means that there's some measure of choice, not, not that you choose everything. No, within your circle of choice, there's a measure of choice. There's a dimension mm -hmm. in which you can transform, which is the essence of your story, is itself a first principle and first value of reality. And how do you know that's true? Because reality itself is always transforming. Mm -hmm. And that's the, we're, we're kind of, the kind of pseudo position of kind of Harris, DeGrasse Tyson, you know, Skinner, Pentland breaks down is, well, reality actually doesn't only operate based on the antecedent causes because reality is always creating newness. And as we didn't stop at hydrogen, at every level of reality, actually reality generates transformation and something entirely new with entirely new depth and entirely new aliveness and entirely new eros and entirely new beauty and entirely new goodness emerges. Yeah. That's exactly Evolution is a series of transformations. Which is why I hate the why I hate the aphorism, there's nothing new under the sun. It's a fucking lie. Right. So so it's interesting, right? What Solomon meant by that aphorism, right? Right, was what he meant was he said, there's nothing new under the sun. What he meant was, and 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 the lineage says what Solomon meant was under the sun, there's antecedent causes. Mm. But above the sun, right, is actually the entire field of value. Mm. Right. And what he meant was, oh, and you, you know, Solomon in Ecclesiastes, he's saying, okay, he's saying, let me take all the antecedent causes shit into effect. Let me look at the materialist view. Let me look at the view. And then let me understand, okay, what's underneath that? What's underneath that is, Solomon says, is that above the sun, it's all new. Ein chadash, there's nothing new. Tachat under the sun, right? Meaning in the material, physical structure of reality. 
Mm-hmm. And everyone says, oh, that's what Solomon meant. You got to read Solomon a little more carefully. I didn't even know it came from Solomon. Yeah. I was surprised to realize that it did. There because we go, right? I understand what Solomon was transmitting and it doesn't make sense. It's right. so dissonant he's missed, with that quote. He's complete. And, and remember that other, that other quote by Solomon where he says, one of his most famous quotes, there's a, you know, Kulzman for everything, there's a time and place, right? He says, you know, there's a time for war and there's a time for peace, a time to love and a time to sow and a time to reap. What he's saying there is that the quality of time itself always invites newness. That newness in the hidden lineage of Solomon, which we trace in that book, Radical Kabbalah, Solomon says that actually, very similar to Whitehead, that actually the creative advance of novelty, meaning transformation as a core structure of reality itself, is the fuck of reality. The fuck of reality is that when you go inside, you're always generating something that never existed before Mm -hmm. and that I can generate a new Chris can become Aubrey. Mm -hmm. Mark can become Mordechai and the Mordechai can become Mark. And right in other words, and and when I take on a new name, what I'm saying is, oh, I actually can be more than I was. Yeah. So let's, 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 let's enter the temple. So this was a big, this was a- Yeah, I mean, the the last thing I want to offer is Please, no, thank you, love. Is- there's other dystopian stories like Minority Report, which also play with this same idea. Totally. Which is the idea that you are on a track. We can identify that track early. Redemption transformation is not possible. possible. Therefore, we'll jail you now for something you've never done. And we inherently know that that's fucking wrong. And that's Armand. That's Steiner's broken planetary temple. So what we're saying is, and it's, it's such, it's so important. The Minority Report is a great example. And by the way, the people that made the Minority Report were deeply in touch with the key figures in tech, what, what, what Zach and I are calling techno-feudalism, what we're calling together at the center techno-feudalism. They were deeply in touch with the key people in the field when they made Minority Report. I did a, a lot of work on that movie. It's a quimly interesting movie, mm-hmm. but you're right. It's exactly, it's saying transformation is not possible. So if we know that you have a predilection to be a murderer, well, arrest you, execute you now. Why wait? Right? Right, right, <laughs> right. right. Because transformation is not possible. So w- what we're saying is, and, and I want to just, it's so deep and subtle and dramatic. And I know, you know, people listening, I know this was a hard entry. We just went in deep. But, you know, it's like, whoa, right, right there. You, Mark? Whoa, whoa. whoa. Like, if so people I, haven't figured it out yet by listening <laughs> to our other podcast. And, oh, my God, right? So, so we went in deep here. So I just want to say it, kind of sum it up. It's not that, oh, Aubrey and Mark, what are they off on, right? Creating some planetary temple. No, that's not a question. There will be a planetary temple. If you're actually in touch with reality, if you're a realist of any kind, you have any connection to what's actually happening, there will be a planetary temple. And it's either going to be the temple of Ironman. It's either going to be the temple of Moloch, the temple of the other side, Sitra Achra. It's either going to be an anti-Eros temple. You know, you, we're, I think we're going to do a dialogue soon on um, Lord of the Rings, mm-hmm. which is about the anti-Eros temple, Sauron and Saruman. So let's mm-hmm. not even talk about that now, yeah. but it's right. But either it's going to be an anti-Eros temple, right? It's going to be a Skinner's box. It's going to be the minority report, right? Or we're going to actually succeed in enacting a temple based on billions of human reactions and billions of humans rising up and actually demanding and enacting and self-organizing and self-actualizing to the most beautiful world we can we can possibly imagine that's gorgeous and unimaginable. So we're, we're not just poised for dystopia. If we can actually recover the field of value, not regressively, not by going back, in the conservative move to pre-modern value, but not making the postmodern deconstruct value. If we can recover value and recover what we mean by value, and value is all rooted in eros, which is what we're going to talk about today, then we can enact a utopia that's unimaginably beautiful. We can enact a world that was the intention, the inherent movement of all of reality itself in a way that no other generation could, but we're literally at a pivoting point. So if we don't enact this temple, if we don't recover, so we got to recover the old wisdom, then merge it with the new wisdoms. That's cosmorotic humanism, what we call the new story of value. So we recover the temple at the core. And then like Solomon, we invite in, right? All the deepest validated wisdoms of all the mystery schools. And then we merge into that complexity theory and chaos theory and the best of evolutionary thought and the best of the 11 schools of psychology. And then we we turn it into a second simplicity, which n- embraces all the complexity and it becomes a universal grammar of value. 
Whether that happens or not is whether we're going to live in dystopia or whether we're going to live at all. Wow. Amen. And, and what's interesting as well as us coming together is you've spent the time in the lineage, in the books, in the study. Right. And I've spent the time in the sacraments right. with, with equal vigilance and dedication yes, you and have, my integrity friend. and faithfulness. Yes, you have, my you friend. Know? And so it's this is a time where both the Dharma, what you call, which is all of this information of cosmoerotic humanism, and, and the medicine. And the medicine are coming together just as you and I are coming together. That's beautiful. To weave something. So and, let's and, go. And that's how it happens, by the way. It, it just, the, the last sentence, and let's go, is it's always personal. And that's so important to understand. It's not just technical, structural. It's personal. It's, it's when two persons are allured, which is the structure of reality, allurement, and they find each other, and it's not rational exactly. It's not like, oh, I can do this, I can do this, oh, he's bringing me this, you know, it's not, it's not. Yeah, we didn't actually figure that out. Right. For like a year. Right. <laughs> like right. That was, like, and that's, no, it's only, it's not to be reductionist, that's the only reason. We genuinely love each other. Right. And enjoy many aspects a thousand of things. our, you know, a thousand right. things. Right. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm hoping to drink with you one day. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. So, uh, yeah, no, right, right, right. I, I don't, don't make me pull out. Yeah, no, 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 <laughs> okay, here we go. We dive in. We dive in. All right. Yeah. Back from a restroom break. And one of the things that emerged as we were just chatting is, again, this is not a regressive move where we're saying, let's be Quakers. Right. Right. In other words, the, the, I mean, I think you said it beautifully in the break, which is there's good shit in that shiny room in hell. Yeah. Right. So the, the idea is not to be a Luddite, right? You know, that, that there's lots of you know, thinkers who talk about, well, it all went wrong in farming, right? And, and everyone tries to figure out where did technology take us wrong? Technology has always existed. Technology means that human beings enact tools and tools always have values. Tools are never value neutral. Tools always have encoded implicit values that are often broken. We need to download evolutionary love, to download Eros, which is really means what we're going to talk about today, to download the Temple of Solomon into the new planetary temple. And so what we're saying is there, there is a planetary temple. It's already in play. It's going to get more and more dramatic. We don't want to not have technology, right? We don't want to not have AI. AI might be unimaginably important. But if we actually enact artificial intelligence, which is cut off from the field of value, meaning it's computational and it's not rooted in the field of Eros, then we will destroy reality. And here's just a good example. There's Aubrey and sitting in front of him. He's got a beautiful head. Now his head, nice head, nice head, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. His head, right, is- A few dings, few dings, mostly yeah. around the, the <laughs> proboscis part of it. Looking good to me. Well, thanks. Right? I, appreciate right. that. I appreciate that. Right. For as much as we talk shit to each other, that was a, that was a surprising compliment, actually. <laughs> there we go. That's there the, we are. That's the real thing, right? Yeah, yeah. Right? So, you know, at Oxford, where I wrote my doctorate, you've got five men in front of the Bodleian Library from the neck up. But even those men from the neck up were ostensibly being just mind aren't because their neck is connected to their body. And my body, we actually know the microbiome, the microbiome is the brain of the gut. We know that actually thinking takes place all through the body. Mm -hmm. And the body is based on this entire field of eros, of allurement, and actually what microchemical reactions are, what chemical reactions are in the body. The body is, I'm going to go slow in this one second, and we'll, we'll, the body's metabolism. Metabolism is the sum total of all the chemical reactions in the body. That's what metabolism is. A chemical is a structure, a configuration of intimacy, a structure of allurement in which there's allurement between two parts that form a larger whole, which as we'll see when we get into the Temple of Solomon is the structure of Eros. So my entire body is muons, leptons, hadrons, right? And then I, I become subatomic particles, protons, neutrons, electrons, all of those are allured to each other, creating larger holes. And so there's the system of allurement moving all through the body, in the blood, in all the systems of the body. And then that integrates with the nervous system, with you know, the, you know, the more neurons in the brain than there are stars in the sky. But that whole system is a system of eros. So my computation that I do is 
ensconced, grounded in a field of eros and value mm -hmm. because there's an entire set of values that are alive in the body. The body is moved by value, right? Value means there's something that's better than something else, which yields more life than something else. So value works all the way down in the body. So when I think, I'm never just thinking. I'm actually thinking, feeling, embodying, right? It's all happening. Mm -hmm. What AI is, is I'm doing computation cut off from all of that, right? All of a sudden I have pure computation, which is not emergent from a ground of value. That's what Nick Bostrom calls, although he doesn't frame it this way, but it's what he's trying to say when he talks about the value uploading problem in AI, right? So when you build a temple not grounded in the field of value, and then you actually destroy the field. Mm -hmm. So what we wanna talk about today was your suggestion to talk about, I'm madly excited, the Temple of Solomon. What is the Temple of Solomon? And how does the Temple of Solomon and Solomon's vision of a planetary temple, right, what is that vision? Or said really simply, what the fuck is the wisdom of Solomon? Mm. I mean, it's everyone in the world knows the wisdom of Solomon. What is it? Let's play. Let's go. Let's go. So it's all about sex and it's not about sex at all. So I want to just start in a, and we're starting in the middle in a kind of crazy place. And we got lots of books. We're surrounded by thousands of books here. So on that shelf over there, kind of shelf three, book seven, right? There's a text which says as follows. Dude's coming home. His wife wasn't expecting him. He was on a business trip someplace else. Gets home. His wife seems a little surprised to see him. Does also seem to be not fully dressed. This is a Talmudic passage in Aramaic. She doesn't seem to be fully dressed. So a little surprised to see him, but he's happy to see her and looks like she's ready to play. So he's, you know, it's all good. And then she's got some, his favorite biscuits out on the little table between them. He's about to eat a biscuit before he goes into play. And a voice comes out from the closet, tumbling out the milkman saying, yo, those are poison. Don't eat them. That's a case in the Talmud, literally. So the Talmud then has the following question. Is this man in the closet considered an adulterer? Do we assume he was committing adultery or not? So the standard assumption yes. says, I think so. Uh, yes. <laughs> and I think so, right? He right. had a moment of ethics. So it so, struck him in the closet. Right, right. So, right. So that's the classical assumption. And then some voice in the study hall raises his, her hand and says, No, you don't get it. He doesn't want him to eat the biscuits because. If he eats the biscuits that are poison, he'll die. Then she won't be married. And he's only attracted to her when she's married because, and then he cites a verse, stolen waters are sweet. Are sweet right? And then the Talmud concludes, the Amar Rabbi Yitzchak and Rabbi Isaac said, from this we know, from the day the temple was destroyed, Nitzla Tambia, the aliveness of fuck, was taken from classical committed relationship and then became more easily available, la ovrea vera, to those who are boundary violators. That's a very strange text. Because what is the text saying? It's saying something about the temple has to do with fuck and eros mm. or fucking sex. Well, let's not keep the word eros out for a little bit. So somehow, when you're in times of the temple, and we don't just mean historical times. The Talmud doesn't mean until the moment, the year the temple is destroyed. The Talmud means when there's temple consciousness, then I can access the radical aliveness of fuck, of boundary-breaking sexuality within my committed relationship. And as I can have the experience, in the best sense of the term, of committing adultery with my wife. Which is goes back to what I referenced earlier on. I'm marrying a new Vailana every time we get <laughs> I'm marrying a new Vailana. I'm breaking a new boundary every time. Correct. So, so the Talmud is this Aramaic text, third century is it's like I'm having sex with a virgin every night. I'm having sex if, with a virgin. Because we're on the path of transformation because we're, we're on transforming. Right. It's right. So so the Talmud is is actually pointing to that experience. Talmud is saying that experience that Abra's having with Vailana, that's temple consciousness. Mm-hmm. That temple, and it's beautiful, that temple consciousness is the capacity to actually 
experience boundary breaking in what seems to be a relationship that has no boundaries. No, actually, there's another boundary to break. So temple consciousness is the ability to experience the full aliveness of sexing in the experience of a committed relationship. And the fall of the temple, the fall of temple consciousness is when you can only access that dimension, right? That aliveness of fuck when you're breaking a transgressive boundary. Only a transgressive boundary will give you that aliveness. That's called the fall of the temple. So to rebuild the temple, to access temple consciousness, that's a big deal. So that's one. That's source one. Yeah. Source two. Source two. Our favorite source, Raiders of the Lost Ark, Harrison Ford, who's gotten a little older. Yeah, there it is, right? And he's still got it. He's still got it. He's, he's still got it, right? He's still got it. He's still got it. He does, right? And so, KK, there's there's hope for me, right? He's right. Harrison Ford, okay? Like for the very first time, okay? So, so here we go. So Raiders of the Lost Ark is the Ark of the Covenant. And the Ark of the Covenant is in the temple in Jerusalem. And it's in the Holy of Holies of the temple, which is the innermost sanctum of the temple. So there's the outer courtyard. There's the inner place, which is called the Holy. And then there's what's called Kodesh Kodeshim, the Holy of Holies. Like we study together, we study what we call the Holy of Holies. That's from the temple tradition, the Holy of Holies. And at the center of the Holy of Holies is an Ark of the Covenant that has tablets in it. And above the Ark are two cherubs. And those two cherubs are in the language of the Talmud in the third to fifth century. Those two cherubs are Mu'urim Zebze. And Mu'urim, if you look at the English translation, right, it'll say something you know, very, very vague. They're clinging or they're, you know. Mu'urim comes from the Hebrew word er, which means aroused. Erva, which means either phallus or yoni. So Mu'urim, they're sexually entwined. Then the text reads, numbers, and the voice of God emerges, I will speak to you, I will meet you, that the prophecy meaning the experience of of actually participating and hearing the divine voice and having the divine voice speak through you, I will speak to you from between the two cherubs. So you have these fucking cherubs, gorgeously. Literally. Literally, right? That are literally making love. The voice of God emerges from between them. And that is the image. Imagine if your local priest, imam, rabbi puts cherubs in the middle of their synagogue church mosque no matter how progressive they are, they'll be fired that week. It's not happening. Right. Now, I've heard, I've heard you tell this story. Right. And I've, it's never aroused this particular question to be asked directly. I like the word aroused. <laughs> Why were they cherubs? Because cherubs are actually... That's such a gorgeous question. I love that. It's so gorgeous. Are young babies. So, so baby. Cherubs have these baby faces. Right. Right. And so, and by the way, you're, you're, the sense of the baby faces is actually rooted... In the lineage, it's not just on a Hallmark card. Mm -hmm. So it's a sense of, and it's about the second innocence of mm -hmm. fuck. Mm -hmm. In other words, our sense of sexuality, right, is such that it, it's this broken, degraded sense, right? We call, that's why we tell dirty jokes. It's why we curse people with the word fuck, mm -hmm. right? But, but actually, there's a dimension of sexing where I actually reclaim and heal that which is broken, right? So, and let's, I'm, I'm not gonna go down fully down the road, but just for a moment, let's say you weren't held the way you needed to be held and you weren't kissed or licked, right? In the best sense, right? And you weren't, right, swaddled, right? And then when is that healed and where is that healed? That's healed in a kind of healing sexing mm -hmm. where your partner gathers you up. So there's a dimension of sexing which has a purity, there's a purity of fuck. There's a goodness of fuck that we've lost. Mm -hmm. And so the lineage captures that. I so, I'm ecstatic that, that you inquired of that. And it's a, such a good intuition. The lineage is saying second innocence, yeah. the purity of fuck, right? Which is, right, the fuck that is the architecture of cosmos, right? And so there's the sense, right, of these cherubs who are the second innocence right? A fuck, there's a first innocence, right? Which is 
just there, right? When we're children, we don't know anything. Then we, we go, we go to guilty. It's figuring out how to, we spoke about this on a podcast recently and Von Lana offered, it was finding that the pool jets could actually arouse her when she was a little girl. Right. Right, like first the first innocence. innocence of that, she just liked to go swimming a lot. Right, right. Let me, let's, go, <laughs> let's go swimming. <laughs> let's go swimming. Mom. Are the jets on, mom? <laughs> and and then you know? and then we get and then we get shamed for it. Yep. And and when we shame, we're shamed. We're shaming our aliveness. And when we're very young, our goodness and our aliveness are inextricably linked. So the shaming of our aliveness becomes the shaming of our goodness. And then we get to. Guilty feet have got no rhythm, which is guilty feet, which is a song about some violation and sexing because we get guilty. But then we reclaim this dimension of sexuality, which is going to be the core of the Temple of Solomon. We're going to get to it. But, but just for now, we reclaim the second innocence. So the cherubs, the face, the innocent face of the cherubs point to the second innocence. Right. But now pulling us back to our thread for a second with permission. Yep. So the second source we just quoted Right, which is Tractate Yoma in the Talmud, page 54a, is talking about these cherubs that are sexually intertwisted. So why is, in the first source, we've got the sexual story that's linked to the temple in which illicit, boundary-breaking sexuality is the symbol of the fallen temple, and temple consciousness is mad aliveness, adultery with your wife. Why is that linked to the temple, number one? Then we have the cherubs who are sexually intertwisted that are linked to the temple. And I would just do one more source, just to be... Let's just go wild for a second, okay? So there's another source in the Talmud. These are all third to fifth century Aramaic texts. The Talmud says the rabbis were having trouble because people were not sleeping with the right people. It was not, it was not going well. So they figure, <laughs> let's pray. What are we going to pray for? Let's pray. It's a that, little bit presumptive on the part of the rabbis well, to say you know, that they were sleeping with the wrong person. But you know, you know what? There was a little adultery. It was, it was, it was getting hard. It was <laughs> okay, getting hard, okay. and not in the good way. And yeah, anyway, yeah. you got the idea. Okay, right. Yeah, fair enough. Let's not let's not carry that through. Okay, so so they pray, and what do they pray for? They pray that God will nullify, disempower the yetzer the drive for sexuality. God says in this mythic scene, God says, I don't think that's a good idea. And they said, no, 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 please. God says, really, don't do this. They everybody don't. fucking everybody. Right, right. Everybody we're fucking everybody. We're out of control. We're here. out of control. We, we got to stop this. Have you been to Sodom, God? Have you been to, right? It's, it's, it's bad. It's crazy. And Gomorrah, even worse. It's bad there. It's bad there. And that's, that's right. Thanos' daughter is named Gamora, right? I mean, that's, that's that's different conversation. Okay, so <laughs> so whoa, sorry about that. So so so, no wonder Star Lord likes her so much. No, I know, I know, I know. That's, that's, the, that's, secret. That, that's the that's the secret. That is text a, of the Guardians me, of the Galaxy that you, we're gonna have you, to talk about. We're gonna have to talk Gamora about that. Gamora owns the has the codes right. of Gamora. She does. There had to be some good reason. She does. She I does. mean, I understand. She does. She does. I understand but, the Book of Sodom, but I am not. Gonna but I don't you, understand. The I book am of... not going to let you seduce <laughs> me into our Guardians of Galaxy conversation. Although it's very tempting. <laughs> yes. All okay. Right. It's very tempting. So so God says, okay, I'll do it. You guys want me to do it? I'll do it. Then no one gets up the next morning. No one goes to work. No one plants. No one creates. No one paints. So they realize this is not going well. So they say to God, okay, can you cut it in half? We'll only have half. We'll have enough desire for our partners, but we won't have illicit desire, you know, boundary breaking desire. Mm. And then the divine voice, which is the voice of the prophet, the prophet, they hear this divine Shekhinah voice. The Shekhinah says, Ein palga. you can't split the Yetzer. Right, the drive for sexuality, for fuck, can't split it in half. It's a whole package. It's mm. all, you can't split it in half. So then they see, they see in this incredible medicine journey vision, they see two lions of fire leaping forth from the holy of holies in the temple. And one lion of fire was the drive for fuck, the drive for sexuality. And then they're, they're shocked. Because why is this line of fire, which is the drive for fuck, in the Holy of Holies? What's it doing there? Now, the second one, which I'm not going to go down that road, but the second one was the actual drive for idolatry. So that they actually, the entire biblical story is to actually attack and undermine paganism. But then you have this hidden text that says, 
oh, but actually, the actual drive for idolatry was a lion of fire in the Holy of Holies, meaning there's a holy spark to paganism, which is exactly what Solomon was saying. He's mm. saying, let's bring everyone in. But now let's go back. Let's step back for a second. Just I'm st- very seduced to go into the holy spark of paganism. I know, I know you are. I know you are. I know, but we're but gonna get there today. Respect. All right. No, but right. we're gonna get there today. We're gonna get there okay. today. So here we go. So, so we now we just deduced three sources. We're doing the real thing now. We just deduced three texts that all identify sexuality with the temple, right? The drive for full fuck is a lion of fire that lives where? In the Holy of Holies of the temple. Mm-hmm. In the Holy of Holies of the temple, we have two cherubs, right? Above the ark who are engaged in full eros, full, full fuck. And that's source two. And then source three, right? This notion that only in temple consciousness do you have full radical aliveness of boundary breaking fuck with your committed partner. Those are three sources that are never drawn together. This is a hidden tradition. They're, right? And they're actually pointing to something. And they're pointing to what? So they're not saying that the entire temple is about sex. That's not what they're saying. They're saying something much more subtle and much more interesting. They're saying the entire temple is about eros. That's what they're saying. So the temple, and we'll have to talk maybe in a few minutes, what's the relationship between sex and eros? Mm-hmm. Let's take that aside for a second. They're saying it's all about eros. In other words, in the temple, the temple is the place where the Shekhinah lives. And the Shekhinah, the feminine goddess divine that lives in every man and every woman, the Shekhinah lives in the space between the cherubs, as it were. In other words, in the, in the planetary architecture, the world stone that's the center of the temple is the energy of Shekhinah. It's the force, right, that actually binds all things, as it were. And in this Shekhinah that we've talked about so deeply in Holy of Holies together in so many contexts, so let's be in second innocent, naive children and talk about it kind of freshly, the Shekhinah, Shekhinah in its deepest sense is Eros. And I remember reading, I mean, literally a thousand texts and talking to Moshe Idel, who's actually the and a leading scholar of Kabbalah in the academic world in 2002, and sharing with them that my reading of Shekhinah was Eros. And I was writing a book then called Mystery of Love. We originally were going to title it on the erotic and the holy, and it got turned by the publisher into Mystery of Love. And, and you suggested, and we're going to reclaim the original erotic mm-hmm. and the holy in a new book. But And we, and we did a, a CD series called The Erotic and the Holy. And, and Moshe, this Kabbalistic scholar, right, who also became my thesis advisor later in Oxford, Moshe, that's, that's exactly right. And he said, he said, wow, I can't believe you're writing on that. He said, I'm writing on the same thing, right? And I, so I put out this book, this erotic and holy material in 2003 and four, and Moshe in 2005 put out an academic book called Kabbalah and Eros, which emerged from this conversation we had in the library, right, in bar University. But what I'm saying is, the point, why am I mentioning that little segue? Not, not as an anecdote, meaning when I'm saying the Shekhinah is Eros, I'm not joking. Mm-hmm. I'm not making some kind of metaphor. No, actually, the best read of the word Shekhinah, which is the energy that dwells between the cherubs, which is the energy of cosmos itself, is Eros. Reality is, that's what what the Temple of Solomon is saying. The Temple of Solomon is saying reality is Eros. And Eros is this very particular quality, which is the quality of value in cosmos. It's all valuable. And it's all alive. And eros is the experience that I'm in a field of value in which matter, the word matter, is that it all matters. In other words, in the word matter means, I mean, it's, language is always matter. It Matter means, oh, it's matter. It's just physical. No, no. Matter means it matters. And it's the world's made up of matter and the world's made up of what matters. And they're the same thing. It's almost like there's two ideologies, either matter matters or matter doesn't matter. And one is saying that the world beyond is the only world that matters. And one is saying that the kingdom of heaven is right here. And so matter fucking matters. Matter fucking matters, right? In other words, the materialist says matters just matter, right? The transcendentalist says, no, only the future world matters. The Temple of Solomon says, no, no, what matters and matter are completely bound up. And it's actually sentient. Reality is sentient all the way up and all the way down. And it's why, you know, in... In a real battle in Lord of the Rings, which is another thing we we're going to talk about, the trees participate in the battle. Mm. It's the why ants. in the south, right? That's right, right. 
the hills are alive and the sound of music, ah, right? In other words, it's, it's all living. In Hebrew, the word for thing, thing is davar. And davar means thing, and davar means speech, logos, meaning. So there's no split. So eros means, eros is, and there, there's, and I've worked for, you know, the last couple of decades to kind of deeply formulate and kind of what we call interior science equations, right? This vision of the wisdom of Solomon. So the wisdom of Solomon says reality is eros all the way up and all the way down. And eros is the experience that everything matters. We live in a field of value and that field of value is doing something, right? So eros is the experience of radical aliveness, desiring, moving towards ever deeper contact and ever greater wholeness. That's the Temple of Solomon. Mm. Right? And that's reality. So, so what, what I haven't actually fully understood yeah. in this conversation, and also I didn't understand necessarily when I went to the temples in Egypt, is I understand, and you, you know, actually explained it again, you know, impeccably. So I understand what the value structure of the temple is and the temple that lives on and the temple that's built in time, which is value and that extends. But what were they actually doing in the Kadesh Kodeshim, right? Like what were they actually doing in the Holy of Holies to actually physically embody, experience, have a gnosis of this era? So like, what were they doing? So let's, let's play for a second. Okay. Let's play. Beautiful. So I'm going to, I'm going to take that inquiry I'm going to hold it. I'm going to bracket it for a second. Okay. And then we'll, we'll circle back to it. But we, we got it there. It's like there on the, the placards in front of us, okay? Because what will help us will be to understand Eros even more deeply. Then we'll be able to go to what was the action. But right. I, I want to just get Eros deeply yep. because I want to try and find our way. There's, you know, I was just, um, I was just thinking last night. I was thinking about Eros, thinking about a way to say it. And I remembered <clears throat> there's a movie about Isaac Stern. I'm called From Mao to Mozart, the violinist. And he goes, and you know, Isaac Stern kind of comes out of the lineage. Just he breathes it and lives it. He's in the Hebrew lineage and he, he goes to play violin and he pours it all into music. <clears throat> and, he's, and he's teaching these children who are the children of the Mao revolution. And they're technically unimaginably proficient. They know exactly how to play, right? So this girl plays a piece of Mozart with technical, unimaginable precision. And he says, no, thank you. And she gets, you know, a round of applause. And he says, let me play it for you. And he plays the same thing. And it soars and it moves and, and it's just a completely different piece. And everyone's just heart just erupts and the place goes totally silent and just explodes. And she looks at him, she says, well, she doesn't know what he did. And she said, you think you play the music, but the music plays you. But it's actually even deeper than that, right? something deeper than you or the instrument is playing you both. Mm -hmm. That's Eros. Mm -hmm. That's Eros, right? It's that. So Eros is this realization, this experience of being on the inside of reality. Eros is what reality feels like on the inside of the inside. So you're, you're in the zone in basketball. Mm -hmm. You're inside, right? You know, um, our friend Aaron, he's passing. And mm -hmm. right? he described to me the backfield. It's like, oh, it's like in that moment, he can see everything. He's on the inside, mm -hmm. right? You're playing basketball, mm -hmm. right? Right. I'll never play against you because I'll lose that good one. Idea. Right? Good idea. I know, right? But I've watched you play ball, right? You're on the inside. Right. It's like, boom, right? So you're not thinking. Something deeper is playing you. Something deeper yeah. is moving through you. I remember when I was first, 20 years ago, I was first writing notes, you know, 20, 30 on, on this. And I remember there's a movie with God I was dating myself, Dustin Hoffman, Marathon Man. It's an old, crazy movie where there's this scene in which he's jogging and there's a certain moment. And I, I used to jog all the time. Like I would run as a big runner. There's a moment when you run, it's the scene in Marathon Man where Dustin Hoffman's running, running, running. And then he breaks through. Mm -hmm. And it's no longer running and annoying. You're just, you're the wind and you're the, you're the air, right? And you're the pavement and your movement itself. And you just, and that's, that was the joy of running, mm -hmm. right? Chariots of fire, 
has this great, the movie has this great scene where Eric Little mm. would run and he would break through. There's something that he could do. And he said, I'm running as God, right? So that's Eros. So Eros is this experience where I'm on the inside of the inside and on the inside of the inside, I'm, I, I'm filled with this unimaginable fullness. It's full. It's like, that's Eros. When the fullness isn't there, it's pseudo Eros. That you can't tolerate the emptiness, you move to fill it with what we call pseudo Eros. So the first quality of Eros is interiority. It's this living on the fucking inside of the inside, which is why the Holy of Holies has a second name. It's called Lifnai or Lifnim, to be on the inside of the inside. Now that's not measurable for a Skinner's box, right? That's not, you can't commodify the inside of the inside. Right. Right? In other words, the entire movement of the World Wide Web is to actually manipulate through the lowest common denominator of a human being right? in order to get me to respond to prompts and nudges that give me egoic security because I feel empty. So that's exactly the opposite of Eros. Right? The second quality of Eros is fullness, fullness of presence. When there's no fullness of presence, there's emptiness. When there's emptiness, I can be manipulated. What am I manipulated by? Any form of addiction, mm -hmm. any form of pseudo eros, right? Actually addicts me. It's why social media is addictive. I have to go back. Please. One thing, so Please. one thing that you said is that being on the inside of the inside cannot be measured. And there is a fairly famous study that was cited by a variety of individuals who you've named previously on this podcast who are in this kind of pendulum in mindset. And it's a study of whether the phenomenon of being in the zone is a real phenomenon. Right. So they tried to computationally analyze this by whether if a basketball player made the last two shots in a row, whether their sure third shot would go in, which to them was saying, if you made two right. shots must mean you're in the zone. Meaning that if that's a true phenomenon, rather than just your next shot is statistically, right. You know, going to be the same as your shots before. So they tried to measure it. But the thing is, any real basketball player knows you can hit two shots and be completely in your head and completely fucked up and not even anywhere close to the zone. You can miss two shots and actually be in the zone. Right. You can't actually measure it unless you're inside the inside of the person who's playing. And at the moment they went to tell you, hey, I'm in the zone, you're out. You're out. That's exactly <laughs> right. That, that's right. At the moment you become aware of it. Right. So actually, it's gorgeous. Wolf of Jitamir, a major master in Hasidism, he says, if you're speaking, you can hear yourself talking, sit down. Yeah. Right. You just, yeah. You're out of the zone. You just left those. You which just is, left which, the which zone. actually denies the possibility of measurement and computation of Eros. It's exactly gorgeous. You know, um, Stuart Kaufman wrote um, or worked on with a guy named Perry Marshall, who's a great guy, an article about, you know, published in a formal journal about biology transcending computation. That biology actually literally mathematically, Stuart's a, a mathematic mathematician, among other things, right? So biology literally transcends computation. And if you really understand quantum indeterminacy and, and the deeper you understand chemistry, Ross Stein, actually Zach Stein's father, right? My partner, our partner at the center, right? Writes about the, the inability to, to even reduce chemistry to computation, right? So in other words, Eros is not reducible to computation and the planetary temple of Moloch the planetary temple of Sitra Achra, the other side, which is based on computation, is actually the, the death of our humanity, quite, quite literally. Mm. And so Eros is this experience of being on the inside and the inside. And, and it's, and the old religions were about the journey to God. The God was out there. Now there is a divine energy and intelligence that envelops us and holds us. But ultimately, the journey to God is over. The journey in God has now begun. I mean, was it even a journey to God? It just seems like obeisance to God. Well, there were there were holy sparks of the journey, which right. is a journey to God, right? You know, which was beautiful. And then there were there were corruptions of it. But but there is a a second, a different conversation. There's a deep sense of a personhood of cosmos that I can actually speak to that holds me. Mm -hmm. That's actually real and it's a different conversation. But but really, religion as the journey to God is over. 
Yeah. A new world religion as the context for our diversity as the beginning of the journey in God, you know, has begun. And, and it's why the Masons who were emergent from the temple, the doors, right, in, in the Mason temples would be open from the inside. You're opening it from the inside because right? that's the point, right? In other words, it's, it's what, and, and every mystic understood and every interior scientist understood it, right? I'm, how did, how did Rumi write it? I'm living on the lips of insanity. I knock, I wonder, and then I realize I've been knocking from the inside, mm. right? right? In other words, the, the realization that I, I'm actually, value lives on the inside and value is unfuckable. It's not commodifiable, right? It's not reducible, right? It's not measurable, right? It's the beginning of the immeasurable. It's the reclaiming of the immeasurable. And it's about fullness. Now, addiction is pseudo-eros. Addiction is the opposite of fullness. It's the opposite of eros. And as there's an absence of eros, when there's an absence of eros, then ethics breaks down. So we think we're going to get to ethics by, by the right rules, by the right systems of obligation. They always break down. They never work. Right? Actually, all ethical breakdown is actually a prior failure of eros. I'm not in the fullness. We can find it in our own lives. I'm not in the fullness. Mm -hmm. I feel empty. I can't tolerate the emptiness, right? And so I move to fill the emptiness. That filling of the emptiness is what we call pseudo eros. Pseudo eros is the design imperative of the Skinner's box. It's like, wow, the prompts and the nudges that Cass Sunnenstein likes so much, right? And, and that, that, that Pentland builds in his book, Social Physics, right? 2014, MIT Media Lab. It's built on pseudo Eros. But the assumption of Pentland is that Eros isn't real. Mm -hmm. So he's got no choice. I, and, and by the way, I don't demonize Pentland. You know, and as I, I, I mentioned him and nor the MIT Media Lab, I mentioned him in a, a dialogue in passing with our friend, Paul Check, and, and I, Paul's awesome. And thank you. I, I met him actually through your friend, Kyle. So it's mm -hmm. really through you, right? And Paul's awesome. And he was like, oh my God, these guys in Paul's, you know, he's like, he's like, take no prisoner. Take him out. I'm take a lick. Him, take, he's, and Paul's beautiful, right? Yep. But we had this beautiful conversation. I think, I think that's actually not quite, he's actually, I'm sure he's a great guy, but he actually- maybe. Right, right. I, I'm I, somewhere between you and Paul. I know, I know you are. I know you are. I know we've had, and, and I think you all are a good guy also. We've had that argument. Yeah, I, yeah. And a whole bunch of people on your thread said, how could you say that he's eating? And no, that's not true. Right, he's actually operating on the assumption. Yuval takes existential risk here. Yuval and I are from the same neighborhood in, in Israel, the same hood as it were. Yuval takes existential risk seriously, just like Skinner did. That's the paradox. They're actually, but what they're saying is wrongly because they're actually popularizers in the realm of deep thought. Yuval's a decent historian. You know, Alex is a good data scientist, but they're not doing deep thought. So they're taking for granted that Eros is not real and Eros is value. Eros is the primary value of cosmos. Mm -hmm. the, the value of cosmos is the experience of radical aliveness, desiring ever deeper contact and ever greater wholeness. That's, that is the structure of cosmos. Now, you, you, can we go crazy for a second? Yes. And also, I wanna, I'll, also want to tell a story. Tell a story. So through this last year and a half-ish of time that we've spent together, I've clarified my understanding of the divine, which, Chum. of course, experientially, through all my medicine journeys and through my study of various sources, I had a good sense of the divine and actually could feel, you know, the voice, the presence, the 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 emergence of my state with the state of the all that is right. and so i had some like good seeds and good foundations but as it's clarified and i've also clarified my purpose to be yeah. fully all in for all life which means i'm on god's team and i understand god as eros as shekinah as that's at least one of the primary faces of of the that's divine. been our dive that's been our dive and i was in a in a medicine journey recently and it was actually after montana and i went to montana i went to the hot springs mm -hmm. that were coming which is volcanic waters that are coming out and Shot. they're collected in different pools and there's cold pools and hot pools and it was after that experience and i actually went into a journey and i got in this dialogue which with with what felt like the god voice yeah right it was like me and the god voice and i was like whoa you know, it's not the, not the only time that that's happened, but I felt like there was an opening. There was yeah. a, there was an opportunity. 
And I started to show God all of the things that I wanted to do. And I showed him, I was like, I want to build temples with hot springs and the hot springs have water that cascade off of citrine Shaw. crystals Shaw. and it moves down. And on the other side is an aquamarine pool that's chilled to 36 degrees and you can move from one to the other. And then there's, you know, erotic, erotic chambers where you can make love. And there's all, like I was thinking all of these things. And then also, and this is what I want to support in the world. I want to support this drive for value, this feeling of actually reclaiming right. our sovereignty and standing together, right. casting nobody on the outside, everybody on the right. inside. I'm going through this and I could feel God going, yeah, me sure. too. <laughs> like I'm into it. And I was like, you're into it? And God, Shakina was like, yeah, I'm into it. Of and I'm like, fuck yeah. Fuck yeah. Let's go. Let's go. And I felt really for the first time in my life right. that even though I, my own personal desires, and yes, I would benefit from the citrine waters and the, and the you know, amethyst pools and the, all of that, but God wants that too. And it included me and transcended me so and everything important. that I wanted and everything that the world wanted. It was all like, yes, let's do this. That's gorgeous. Let's do this together. I, I that's so gorgeous. And let's, and let's stay with the story. Okay. This is, and then we'll, we'll go wild in the, in another way. We'll come back to the wild thread in a second, but so, you know, in, in kind of new age literature, there's a deep, there's an attempt to kind of access cheap grace. And the cheap grace is I am God. I kind of say to people like, just relax. Right? <laughs> yeah, for sure. Just, just relax everyone. You know what I mean? Really? You motherfucker. <laughs> right. And it's, it, first there has to be a sense of I'm enveloped in this field that holds me that speaks to me, that's not a regressive small God, but it's the person of cosmos whose will I do. And yet in the deepest clarification of my own will, I realize, oh my God, me too, right? I want what she wants and she wants what I want. Yeah. Me too. Yeah. Right. And that's, that's a, that's, that's a, that's a good elevation right? Of, of some of the shadows of me too, right? So <laughs> you know, bracket, yeah. that's a bracket. But so now here's gorgeous. So Solomon writes the whole, the Holy of Holies. He, in Acts, builds the Holy of Holies. And Solomon also writes the Song of Solomon, the Song of Songs. And the Song of Songs is this erotic slash pornographic. And when I say pornographic, I mean, it's pornographic in the sense that it's explicit. It's not elusively sexual. It's explicitly sexual. All the imagery is sexual, right? I mean, pomegranates may stand for something else than pomegranates. You've never been a farmer. <laughs> <laughs> you know, right, right, right. And, and it, it, it's explicit in, in farming language. That's, that's, <laughs> yes, that's absolutely sure. true, right? And, you know, diglo alaiha va his staff, right, is on me in love. And, and you know, and, and the, right, but well, well right. In, in, in chapter, I think, eight of Return to Eros, where I wrote with KK, we, we read a chapter called The Sexy Song of Solomon, where we unpacked the song. But mm -hmm. it begins with, Mashcheni acharecha, draw me after you, narutza, and I will run to you. So the image is, the lover says to the beloved, seduce me. It's not about consent. Consent's a given. Right? Consent's like the lowest bar, right? Right? No, no, no. Seduce me. Then after you seduce me, you've drawn me and drawn me in, and then something takes over. We all know that moment where there's no choice anymore. And I step inside and I run towards you, right? So that's in the, it's either in the 90 seconds before explosion or the, the hour before, the three hours before. But the word is, I'll run towards you is rutsa, I run, which is the same root. It's this core word of the word will, ratzon. So will, the experience of will is that moment in sexuality when I give up my lower will, but I, I haven't abandoned myself to something which is lower, I've actually embraced my higher knowing, mm -hmm. which is why when I look at you at the moment before explosion, I say, oh my God, I love you madly, I see you. That's actually true, right? And that's because I can see more clearly than I've ever been able to see before. So will is the experience of divine eros moving in me. So the word for will for Solomon is a word which means 
The word will means the moments before sexual explosion where the lower will of the egoic Skinner's Bach is abandoned and that dimension of humanity, which is irreducible and immeasurable, emerges and I'm taken over right, by this field of the divine and I open into the my baby face, but in other words, my child purity and yeah, second innocence. Yeah, for sure. Right? That's that's the will. So that's the experience you had. Yeah. Where, where you actually experience my will is not narcissistic. It's not egoic. And, and it's not just God's in me. No, in other words, my will is ontically merged. There's an ontic merger between my will and the divine will, and there's no split between them. Yeah. And when we talk about this as the clarification of desire bearer. And this is all through radical Kabbalah. And we've we've studied with this, but it was actually the first point where I felt, okay, okay, like, here we are. We're in, I've clarified for this, this moment. And it's not like I'm there all the time right. and everything I'm thinking is exactly what this the divine is true. Was. You know, it was like, but for that moment, as I was going through the fantasies of what I wanted to help birth into the world, not just for me, but to really birth into the world and imagining a world where people don't have the same jobs they used to because maybe Bobby Kennedy becomes president and he dismantles the war machine, bracket for another category, dismantles all of these other things. And we need things to do. So we build art and beautiful things and we turn hot springs into these crystal pools and we make- We become wildly creative. Wildly creative. And in that world- unleashed. Eros everywhere, an invitation, a living invitation. And we, and, and we have to talk about what that world would look like. Oh. That's unimaginably important because when Mark Zuckerberg right describes what will happen when people don't have jobs, they'll be in the metaverse. What will happen? Everyone will do their art project. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about this wild, profound realization of unimaginably beautiful individuated creativity in which your unique gift actually downloads into reality and matters. And actually every person, there was a movie, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago called The Truman Show, where mm. where everything revolves around this one person. So there's a notion in cosmology of multiple centers, right? So the new world, this world of Eros, in which every human being is the center of the story, every, every human being stars and everyone else is a supporting actor, but there's interlocking films and the reality is 7 billion interlocking films Right, that are part of this magnificent, unimaginable, unique self-symphony, which there's irreducible value in personhood, right, to every individuated expression of the divine. That's that's shocking. Wow. So we have these, we have these two faces of Eros. Eros is interiority, being on the inside of the inside. And Eros is fullness, this radical fullness, pseudo-eros, addiction. And, and by the way, the best definition of addiction is geta. You can't stop doing it, <laughs> but you want to because the emptiness is too painful. Now mm-hmm. you just introduced gorgeously the third face of Eros, desire. So it, let's just maybe for a second, because I know we've studied this, but it's just so beautiful to share with people. So on our screen in front of us. What used to be on the screen. What in front used of to us. be on the screen. And in front what of us. will soon be on the screen in front Cha! of us. And let there be light. So and Derek makes the makes the name of God appear. <laughs> Derek makes the name of God appear. That's what right? Derek means in the language. Oh my God. Derek. Right? It's Derek, meaning the name of God appears. The name of God appears. <laughs> right. And by the way, Derek, that may not be Derek, true. Derek in Hebrew is no, it's good. Derek <laughs> in Hebrew is Derek, which is the way. So that's what Jesus said. Jesus said, I am the way. <laughs> and there we go. All right. There we go. I, are you full of shit or are you serious? True. It means the way. Derek, <laughs> Derek is Derek is the way. Right. Oh my God. I got really lucky. It is good. You did good. <laughs> this is awesome. So, so you see on the screen, that's the four letter name of God. And the name of God is the atomic structure of interior reality. So there's exterior sciences in which there's the structure of reality, which is not really atoms, the structure of reality in, in interior reality, in exterior reality, right, is actually meaning or information. But in interior reality, Right? And interiors and exteriors are tightly linked. It's not that there's exteriors and then you got interiors, inner stuff up there. There's everything's interior and exterior all the way up and all the way down. Right? I call that, you know, we call it in cosmorotic humanism, pan interiority. Mm-hmm. Everything is interior and exterior. There's no interior without an exterior. So for example, the fact that we can trace cocktails of neurochemicals when I'm in love doesn't mean that love is neurochemicals. Right. It means that there's an interior and an exterior. So this is the name of God. 
the four-letter name of God, which is understood in the lineage to be the actual molecular or the DNA code of reality. So it's yud He vav He. So we go from right to left. We read it from right to left. So Yud is the divine point of Eros that enters, right? That's the line quality, the thrusting quality that tenderly, fiercely enters the He. So Ya. So Leonard Cohen's song where he brought that name of God into consciousness, Hallelujah, is Hallelujah. Ya. Ya. Mm -hmm. So it's the first two letters of the name of God is yud He, And yud He is called in the lineage Tre Rayan Dalomit Parshin, two lovers that never stop making love. So that in the physical field would be the four forces. Mm -hmm. The strong and the weak nuclear, electromagnetic, gravitational. Those four forces that are animated by Eros that never stop. They're in every second of reality, madly alluring, right? Reality rooted in this allurement between the Yud and the He. Right, which is the actual structure of the four forces animated by Eros. That's Trey Ray and Delomid Parshin, the two lovers, the Yud and the He, are always together. And then you get to the Vav, the third. Now, if you notice, the Vav is a Yud, the first letter, pulled down. And so the Yud pulled down is the phallus. It's an obvious phallus, right? And the phallus that lives in the masculine and the feminine. And the Vav again enters the He. Mm -hmm. So that's a second erotic union. But the vav entering the he is, now this is crazy shocking. That's what we call today in thought the Anthropocene. The Anthropocene means conscious evolution, meaning where we participate in creating the design structure of reality. Where for the first time, evolution and its direction, we co-create with the divine. Right? What we do determines in some sense, some dimension of the future. So that's called in the lineage, it's two lovers who can separate and need to be aroused towards union. And who arouses the lovers towards union? The union, the eros that takes place in my interior, that place takes place between me and my friend, between me and my beloved, between me and every action that I do. That literally every action that I do, quite literally, is for the sake of the uniting of the yud and the he and the vav and the he. So I participate in both supporting the structure of reality, the constant structure of ele electromagnetic, but I also, so I participate, but I also participate in the eros of reality that causes the vav to enter the hay. So when I'm broken, so I'm in an argument, right? And I'm in an argument with KK, right? You're in an argument with Vailana, right? And I can't, well, I, I can't reach into myself to find that place to go deeper. The vav separates from the hay. Mm. But when I go inside or Vailana goes inside or KK goes inside, right? Or, or whatever, right? Any reality, I'm talking to the waitress and I ask her her name and she lights up because we're not just functions. We're not just I, it, right? I, I, in every dimension of every moment of my life, every feeling and every action in reality, the divine name is either being spelled erotically, hallelujah, ecstatic praise, there's a blaze of light in every word. It doesn't matter which I heard, the holy or the broken hallelujah. It's all hallelujah. That's exactly every second. Or when I'm not in Yehud, I'm not in my own sense of my inner and outer self being one. When there's an exile between the inner and the outer self, when I'm alienated from my words, I'm alienated from my will, I'm alienated from my deepest heart's desire, then the world falls into disrepair and we move into existential risk. So what animates that name of God? Desire. The Yud desires the He. The Vav desires the He. The He desires the Vav. So in other words, the name of God is desire. So the third quality of Eros is desire. That reality is desire all the way up and all the way down. Desire is not the enemy. Desire itself is the actual quality of reality. And here's the crazy thing. Desire is a face of Eros and the interior face of Eros is pleasure. Mm. It's pleasure. It's, you know, one of the big movements that's alive right now that my wife, Ilana, is deeply right. participating in right. with Mama Gina and with Layla and with Emily. And, and we're studying every week. Is, and you guys are studying every week. Is pleasure. 
the reclamation of feminine desire because <clears throat> a lot it seems like culturally and societally of course the yo desires the hey the vav desires desires the hey the masculine desires the feminine like we understand that and we make space for that and actually we demonize it as well so let's right. just, but, but at least we at least we establish that yes that men have a desire for pleasure but there's been this kind of false narrative that there's no right. desire from the feminine for the same ravaging. And there's just this huge reclamation. I mean, Mama Gina, Regina Thomas, our pussy, a reclamation, right? It's like, no, fuck y'all. Like, like, we're like, we want this back too. Quality of desire. First of all, I, I actually apologize. I stepped in too quickly. I just, it was just, I was excited. And I said, oh, Vi and I are studying every week. Actually, we're not studying that topic, which she's studying with Mama Gina and I think with with, with the, all the other beautiful people you mentioned, we're, we're studying the Dharma of pleasure. Yep. But so this is a different Dharma, so I, I stepped in inappropriately. Mm -hmm. We're studying a different Dharma, but let's focus on, let's get to pleasure in a second and just focus on this for a second because it's an unimaginably important, right? So there's a, there's a set of surveys that were done in 1978, 79. They were replayed in a lot of places that basically asked the question, you know, would a man have sex with a stranger on campus? And a huge amount of men said yes, and almost no women said yes, right? And so that, that study, which has been replicated in many places, has been cited in many, many ways to argue for a different quality of masculine and feminine desire. But that's actually a misreading of the study because first off, women don't go home with strangers because it's not safe. That's number one. Yeah. Right, number one. But number two, if you'd asked the same group of women, would you go home with and name some wonderful rock star that everyone loves? They all say yes, because that's that's safe. That's <clears throat> right. In other words, so the feminine knows something unimaginably important. We have to do an entire podcast on it at some point. The feminine understands something of what it means to be aroused by love. Right. So feminine desire is the capacity to be aroused by love. Mm -hmm. Right. And that feminine desire can, of course, live in a man and a woman. And one of the things with KK and I, as we were getting closer and closer, we began to experience like radical arousal through like radical moments of love. When we would move into the space of radical love, it would completely translate into radical desire and all the objective measurements of radical desire. And, and that that's a feminine desire has that key. And imagine what would happen to reality if actually men would be aroused by love. Mm. We would actually live in a different reality. It's interesting that you say that because <clears throat> there's two types of dirty talk that right. bring Vailana into a state of ecstasy. Right. One is classic dirty talk. Right. Right. Like classic, classic power exchange, polarity, dirty talk. That works. The other is just radical, <clears throat> outrageous, mad you know, love, mad love, where I just keep saying over and over how much I love her and how, how crazy I am about her. And that'll similarly bring they're her into states of arousing. ecstasy and climax. And actually they're deeply, and this is a, you know, you were working deeply together with KK on the phenomenology of sexuality with you. So the three of us are deep in that. And that's, I think we've all finished like 16 volumes that we're preparing. <laughs> so there's an entire section, as you know, on this topic. So we, we won't be seduced to go down that door, but just one second, because you've seduced me already slightly, <laughs> right? Which is they're the same. When I say I fucking own you yeah, with my heart wide open, right? If I say it with my heart closed, then it's complete violation. When my heart's wide open and I move to this kind of utter demand of surrender, right? That I can only surrender you if I trust you so fucking deeply. Yeah. And I want you to own me. Yeah. And then I have this unimaginable desire to be owned by you. Fucking own me. Mm -hmm. Right? 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 And so they're deeply intertwined. Yeah. Right? Yeah, it's true. It's, it's the divinity that makes the wickedness safe. It's utter. And, that's and right. Hot. That's right. Right. It's, yeah. it's, it's, it's my heart's wide open and we mad. And if there's one moment of not trust. You fucking own me. Call the fucking police. Right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. But if there's like radical trust. Right right? Then fucking own me. And I won't settle for anything less than you completely own me. And if right. I feel one inch of me not owned, and that can work with the masculine, the feminine, and the feminine, the masculine, right? We want to be actually owned. 
Yeah. Right. So that's the third face of desire. Yeah. I mean, for the masculine, it's, it's, she can seduce me into a state of madness where I lose myself entirely, which is the same as owning me because which is the same as owning she me. actually owns me. I am, I'm actually I mean, surrendering my hello. agency. Hello. Right. I remember talking to you one afternoon. Are you talking to me one afternoon? It doesn't right. Both, both sides were like, oh my God. Right. Vailana's not in a great, we're not feel right. Uh, and oh my God, like complete deflated. Right. Right. Yeah. Mark complete deflated. Well, that's ownership. Right. Now, there's, if the change in someone's mood can completely undo your eros and you're desperate, right, to recreate that union, you're owned. Yep. Right? <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. No doubt. So, so, this third face of the erotic is the sense of radical desire. So, now, and there's actually 12 faces of eros, but let's see if we can bring it home now. So, now, so the temple's eros, not sex. But if that's the case, so why don't we have a guy running? on top of the Holy of Holies. We'll have a jogger right? <laughs> on top of the Holy of Holies, right? Because mm -hmm. he's breaking through. We could have a basket, Aubrey. We could have Aubrey in the zone, mm -hmm. right? Aaron in the zone on top of Holy of Holies, right? We could have, you know, KK when she's teaching, she's like unimaginably on the inside of the inside. Vailana singing with yeah. the bulls, right? But that's not what we have. In other words, the imagery is sexual. It's not an artist painting, right? It's not running not the runner. It's not Marathon Man. It's not Aubrey in the zone. It's not when I'm marks at the height of writing, when I just fall inside, right? And like, oh my God, time, right? No, we have, we have two people fucking mad love, mad arousal. So why? And this is, this is a crazy, gorgeous thing. So I want to just take this slow for a second. Okay. I want to take this slow. So so we have our question. I just want to make sure our question's clear. I know we're moving towards closure. We're probably what? We probably have 15, 20 minutes, something like that? Something like that. Something like that. Okay, so, so the temple is the place of Shekhinah, right? Of, of Eros. The fall of the temple is therefore the fall of Eros. That's called in the lineage Galuta de Shekhinah, the exile of the Shekhinah, the exile of the goddess, the exile of Eros. So the fall of the temple, which is not the physical temple in Jerusalem, it's the fall of temple consciousness. Now stay close with me. Your pagans are coming back in. Paganism had an intuition of temple consciousness. This is so deep and it's so subtle, so we gotta go really careful here. Paganism intuited, oh my God, she lives under every tree. She lives right? In the Astarte, in the Asherah tree, and the Asherah tree needs to be in the Holy of Holies. Paganism had the sense, there's no place devoid of she. Paganism had the sense of wholeness. Mm. We've got to be part of the wholeness of reality. And the fourth face of the erotic is actually wholeness, mm -hmm. the interconnectivity of the all with the all. So the four major faces are being on the inside, fullness of presence, radical desire, and wholeness. And paganism has the sense of wholeness. But paganism says, in Jung, had a sense of the pagan in him, both positively and tragically. It's why he aligned with the Nazis for a short period of time. It's a tragic story. Jung says, I'd rather be whole than good. Right? You know, he's quoted, right? A number, it's a, it's, a, it's a direct quote, but it's also a major theory. Rather be wholeness. Now, wholeness, right, can be scary because you can have a sense of pseudo wholeness. Right? The sense of, it is very scary. The sense of, an, and, and Jung was actually enamored originally by the Nazi Volk, right? The sense of the, the, the enormous Germanic spirit. Right? I'd rather be whole than good. The prophet says, the prophet says, no, 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 no. Eros and ethics are one. There's no split between wholeness and goodness. You cannot make mm -hmm. that split. Mm -hmm. You can't make that split, can't be made. The dark side of the force says, I go for the radical aliveness of Eros and I put goodness aside, right? The Jedi says, I go for goodness and I, you know, and I, I leave the whole Eros thing out. The Christians called that agape. Mm. Agape means actually ethics without eros. So what agape actually is, it's a bad split. The split between eros and agape is, is the broken heritage, right, of, of, of Greece through Christendom. Yeah, eros and agape yeah. are completely one. Into Puritanism. Into Puritanism. So eros and, eros and ethics are one, right? So the prophet says, no, eros and ethics are one because remember the eros formula. Eros is the experience of radical aliveness, desiring ever deeper contact, and ever greater wholeness. What's wholeness? Wholeness in contact is relationship between parts. That's ethics. That's what ethics is. Mm -hmm. The notion that the erotic and the ethical are split is a lie. 
They're one. And I, the, the, I did a cover story once in a magazine called Tikkun called On the Erotic and the Ethical. And it actually what precipitated a whole series of, you know, attacks. It's a long story, but I got wildly attacked within the, the community for that article, right? Because what I was saying was, which is absolutely correct, is that what the temple is saying is the breakdown of eros creates the breakdown of ethics. So in certain sense, the masculine God says, we're going to create ethics by demanding justice. And we're going to see what's, what's the right system of law. And that's important. We need law. The goddess says, pleasure's the source of ethics. But not surface pleasure, not pseudo pleasure, not pseudo eros. I can actually go inside and access, is this deeply pleasurable? Pleasurable is not ice cream. Although, let's not like ice cream, right? It depends what kind. But pleasure is, there's levels of pleasure. There's principles of pleasure. There's the pleasure of power. Mm. Clarify power. There's the pleasure of relationship. There's the pleasure of meaning. There's the pleasure of creativity, right? Pleasure is a very, very multivalent, beautiful expression, which is a different conversation. That's what Valine and I are studying, that, that mm -hmm. topic. So, so actually, the goddess says, pleasure is the source of all ethics. And actually, and if you would summarize all of good evolutionary theory today and really get the edges of evolutionary theory today implicit, evolution evolves because it feels good. All right, so let me, let me, let me challenge. Go. Let me challenge. So I became enamored with the culture of Shavin as transmitted through my teacher, Don Howard. And in the culture of Shavin, they actually held peace in Peru for an astounding period of time, like something estimated like 800 years where there's no sign of warfare. Gorgeous. And one of the reasons why they were able to do that is they served Wachuma, which is a very serotonergic kind of heart opening medicine to all the pilgrims who came by. And it was actually this massive temple of Shavin, which at the center was a Lanzon and the Estella Ramundi, which actually is the, is the inspiration for the sculpture that's at our farm right. that you saw, the Estella Ramundi. Right. 3,000 year old piece of art that we turned into 3D, thanks that's to Daniel Popper, stunning. a whole other story. So I was really enamored with this culture and I was like, aha, they did it, they made it. And then, you know, Don Howard explained, well, the Shavin culture at a coastal town called El Brujo would participate in human sacrifice to control the weather. Right. So that's also, I, I'm assuming that's, exactly that's where- my, no, no, that's exactly, you just hit it. Oh my, oh my God, my, that, that's exactly it. In other words, in other words, you can have an experience of eros that's divorced from ethos, which is why the heros gamos, the marriage of the god and the goddess, mm -hmm. is between justice and pleasure. Yeah. They have to marry each other. There has to be a yichud, a union between those two, between the lion and the circle. And actually, pleasure creates ethics, right? But pleasure means, pleasure means not just the experience of wholeness, right? It's actually an eros that is utterly inseparable from ethos, right? In other words, if there's a lack of content, if there's not right relationship between the parts, now, for example, sacrificing a living person, as the Aztecs did, ripping out, the Aztecs, the new age valorizes, ripping out 10,000 women's hearts, right? That would seem to be a wrong relationship between the parts, right. right? Right. In other words, eros and ethics are one means, and this is very important. There's level one eros, which is eros that is the experience of radical aliveness that doesn't move towards the right relationship of contact between the parts and doesn't create wholeness, which is when every part synergizes and becomes part of the larger whole. That's what eros is. When you actually have level one eros, that's just eros by itself, pre-tragic. It's like full eros. That right. leads you. Which is like a maenadic but dark revelry of sacrifices and which can, blood. It, and, and it can make it for a while. Orgiastic, yeah. It makes it for a while, but then it collapses. Why the great mother societies were based on it, and that was the weakness of paganism. It's why the, the prophet fought with the pagan, because the prophet said to the pagan, you're doing this beautiful eros, but you're doing child sacrifice, you motherfucker. Mm -hmm. right? That was exactly the point. Now you just got it. So the, the prophet says to the pagan, you can't split between being whole and good. You have to be whole and good, and they're inseparable from each other. Just like a child's goodness and aliveness, we said earlier, inextricably linked, the prophet was radically filled with eros. The prophet was not this ethical teacher. 
The prophet was full eros, but in the prophet's realization, the prophet's medicine journey, the prophet has the realization that ethics and eros are inseparable. Mm -hmm. That's the fucking essence of the temple. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's unbelievable, which is why in the temple, the Lishkat Gazit, which was the court, was adjacent to the Holy of Holies, mm. generally adjacent, right? Because the Holy of Holies, Eros, and the court needed to be linked to each other because Eros and ethics are one. So you can't say, I'd rather be good than whole, because if you say, I'd rather be good than whole, you go for goodness, but actually you're missing wholeness, so your goodness collapses, right? Because whenever there's a failure of Eros, right? You feel empty, pseudo eros enters and it becomes addiction and it becomes fascism. Fascism is a form of pseudo eros and it becomes child sacrifice, which is actually a form of pseudo eros. You need genuine eros. Genuine eros means there's a right relationship between all the parts, which is ethics. Right relationship between all the parts only comes when I actually honor the personhood, the value of personhood of all the parts. That's a value. Mm. It's what the Skinner's box doesn't understand. In the Skinner's box, there is no personhood. Personhood's a value. Personhood doesn't exist. Jaron Lanier correctly pointed out in his book about gadgetry 15 years ago that personhood is written out of the techplex. Personhood is the irreducibly unique personhood of every piece of the puzzle and that every puzzle piece is needed for the whole. Mm. Let's go back to the Eros formula. This is the, the essence of the Temple of Solomon. Eros equals radical aliveness. Doesn't stop there, though. <clears throat> Moving towards desiring clarified desire, ever deeper contact, and ever greater wholeness. The second I alienate you, now you can be sacrificed. That's not yeah. ever greater wholeness. So eros and ethics being one is the whole thing. We're allured to each other. If I'm allured to you, I can't rip your heart out. Yeah, of course. And if you actually rep recognize the connection that every person has to you as you basically living a different life, a uniquely different life. Right. But it's you. It's you. It's <laughs> you, you know? right. It's you. And so in other words, in other words, so here's the paradox. So contemporary woke liberal thinking that deconstructs the field of value has stepped out of the field of Eros because it reduces the human being to an exchangeable commodity, right. which means we sacrifice human beings in all sorts of ways, the death of our humanity. But regressive fundamentalism that says only we are fully human, only those who accept Christ in a particular way are fully human, no one else is, and therefore only we who are particular kinds of Sunnis or particular kinds of Shiites or particular kinds of Jews are fully human, no one else is, that's also outside the field of Eros. So the field of Eros means every unique irreducible being has infinite personhood and infinite value. Eros is value. Right? And the unique quality of my interiority right, is Eros. So if I sit with Aubrey in silence, we sit in deep silence together, there's going to be a particular quality to that silence. If you sit with Aaron in silence, there's going to be a different quality to that silence. Yep. That's interiority. You sit with Vailana, different quality to that silence. No, oh, much different quality of that silence. Completely different quality, <laughs> right? Right, completely different. But then you sit, let's say, with your sister, Caitlin. Yeah. Different quality of that silence. It's like, wow, right? It's because that's my interiority. That's immeasurable. And that demands ethics. That means that I'm in devotion to that unique quality of infinity, of the infinity of intimacy. And that name of God that we just saw, right? The yud Hey vav Hey that we're looking at right now, right? What I would call that name of God is, if we can give it a new name, we gave it in cosmorotic humanism, that's the infinite intimate. The new name of God is the infinite intimate, which is infinity, desiring intimacy uniquely with every irreducible unique self, mm. which then creates a new possibility for wholeness. When eros and ethics become one, you have a new planetary temple. It's like chop. Yeah. So, all right. So yeah. as we move to close here. Yeah, please. Let's bring out some sparks of actual actions that were taken inside the Holy Voice because we've never closed, so we never closed that bracket. And then as we're rebuilding the temple holistically yeah. and also individually, what can we do to like make this actionable? So let's learn what they did back there in the Holy of Holies and then 
what can we do in our own temple that we're building together Gorgeous. in time to actually <coughs> worship and build this temple together? Gorgeous. Gorgeous. So that, that brings us back to our last open thread, right? And we don't want to leave open threads. Right. Sure don't want to do that. Okay. So what's the relationship of sex to Eros? So we said the temple's Eros. And we had an open question. Why don't we have a runner on top of the Holy of Holies or, or, or Aubrey in the zone? Why do we have sexuality? Because the sexual models the erotic. And as there's 12 billion years of Eros until sex appears, and then sex appears, and the sexual becomes the most powerful model of Eros. So being on the inside, fullness of presence, desire, the experience of wholeness, these are all modeled in the sexual. And the experience of Eros, which is the experience of the holy, is to experience all these dimensions of the erotic in every dimension of life, not just in sexuality, but the sexual itself becomes the practice of the Holy of Holies. In other words, the practice of the Holy of Holies, the praxis of Holy of Holies is zivug. Now, in the Holy of Holies in the temple, the high priest enters, and the high priest actually has erotic union with the Shekhinah. It's a sexual, right, you know, but enacted, right, on the interior plane. What the lineage says is, the lineage says, is that the temple is not destroyed. That the essence, this is, this is how you began today. The Romans destroyed the temple and we said, no, but it wasn't destroyed. Why? Because the lineage of Solomon that goes right to Akiva and then goes to Shimon Bar Yochai and goes to Lurin, goes to Liner and Radical Kabbalah and comes to us. Mm -hmm. The lineage says, when the temple is destroyed, the place that the Holy of Holies is reenacted is in the sexual bed. And it's the sexual bed becomes in the lineage, the Holy of Holies, quite literally. The sexual bed becomes the place where in the democratization of enlightenment, the high priest and the high priestess enter into sexual union and sexuality becomes the source of all ethics. That every dimension of ethos, I mean, the way you touch the body of your vulnerable beloved and how you touch with, with such fierceness and tenderness, how could you violate that body, right? The experience, for example, that giving and receiving are one. In the enacted economic world, right, in the world of empire, you're either taking money out, you're putting money in, and it's all an economic commodified exchange, right? When you're pleasuring your beloved, you're giving pleasure and you're receiving the biggest gift in the world. Mm -hmm. So giving and receiving become one, a new dimension of, of ethos. You have fantasy. You know how to fantasize about a new world. You can access and fantasy, right? Worlds and worlds. And then you begin to access political imagination. All, and this is a, we're at the end of our, our conversation. We're at the beginning of a new one. But the enactment in the Holy of Holies, the enactment of the Holy of Holies was the erotic merger with essence which was a model, this erotic merger, was understood to be modeled in the sexual, right? And so pilgrims would come to Jerusalem, they'd come to Jerusalem on the, the three great festivals. And actually in this moment right now, when we're talking, we're on the beginning of one of the third pilgrim festivals in this very second. And you come, and when you come to Jerusalem, there's this enormous experience of Mardi Gras, I'm borrowing the term Mardi Gras, but it's an experience of festival. Mm -hmm. And the experience is of a field of eros and a field of love. An experience of a command to radical joy and a command to sexing. And so the, the festival, the pilgrimage festivals, and Sabbath were both places which enacted the Holy of Holies and which a central primary injunction was sexing. Radical, mad, wild, tender, quivering, fierce, raw sexing as an ultimate practice, an ultimate practice. Now, you know, Nietzsche wasn't wrong. Nietzsche intuited this in his own weird brilliance. He said, the summit of a person's spirituality is the summit of their sexuality. Mm. And that's who you are in fuck is actually who you are which means you want to become and fuck something bigger, something deeper, something wider, something more spread. 
and more dripping and more throbbing because you can actually learn, right? Engage, practice the art of holy fuck. Because when we saw the name of God, we said the name of God is desire. If we said it more accurately, we'd say the name of God is fuck. The yud enters the hay and the vav enters. The name of God is fuck. It's fuck all the way up and all the way down. Mm -hmm. And so the sexual models the erotic and the erotic, the migdash, the temple is called the holy place. So the holy place is the place of eros. So the erotic and the holy are one. So, so the place that I practice, right, the holy of holies is sexing. And it's the central practice of the new temple is fuck, but not a fuck which is pseudo eros. And, I was, and here's the thing, here's maybe the last sense, you know, I, I give it back to you, my brother. I'm so happy to see you. Yes, indeed. Madly happy to see you, right? And, you know, so here's the thing. So there's always the Skinner's box, which is the, the pseudo temple, right? It's the broken planetary temple. And then there's the actual planetary temple. So in the broken planetary temple, which is driven by pseudo eros, right? The internet is animated by bad pornography. It's not by accident. In other words, the pornographic in its broken form, not beautiful erotica, right? And by the way, pornography is not, and this is very important, this is a different, but pornography is not in visualizations of intense sexuality, which is how it's described when you look up pornography. Visualizations of intense sexuality, that is not pornography. Pornography is visualizations of intense sexuality out of the context of the narrative of your life. Mm -hmm. So if you would watch a three hour beautiful movie and it had 20 minutes of intense sexuality or 10 minutes, you wouldn't say that's pornography. It's in the context of a narrative and it wouldn't become addictive. It's not addictive, right? The addiction of pornography is when you decontextualize radical intense raw eros from the story of your life. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's pornography. Yeah, which is why erotic fiction, for example, you mm -hmm. always imagine yourself as one of the characters. And so it right. becomes a part of your story in a way that, that actually watching other people do things. Erotic fiction really is work. the reclaiming, right? Exactly. In other words, in, in the planetary temple, which is enacted, which is the opposite of the Skinner's box, where, where we've enacted the temple of Solomon and enacted all the mystery schools and, and all of the, the best scientists' is interior and exterior, right? The planet will be lined with eros, but, but, but actually the erotic, right? And, and, and actually, when you think about it, what tells us that we're not alone? What tells us that we, we need to be connected? We have this inexorable, unimaginable need, a raw need, right? To actually make contact. Sexing. Mm -hmm. Sexing says, and it's why masturbation right? Self-pleasuring in all of its beauty. And it has, it has enormous beauty, but it's insufficient. Self-evidently, yep. right? right? Because there's no contact. Eros is contact. So imagine if we live in a world in which, in which we actually understand that the erotic and the holy are one and the sexual models the erotic. It doesn't exhaust the erotic. Now we're in the temple. Now that's the practice of the temple. Let's, let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Yeah. Let's, uh, I mean, if you're talking about the revolution needs to become irresistible. Right. Well, here we go. Here we if go. The right? revolution and is to restore temple consciousness and temple consciousness is the restoration of Eros and the sexual models, the erotic. Good. Congratulations. Congratulations. You just made the revolution irresistible. Right. right. We made it irresistible. And here's the beauty of it is, so we might think, oh, just go fuck. No, to go fuck with grace, mm -hmm. with elegance, with fierceness, with quivering tenderness, with radical devotion, knowing that desire and devotion are one, that is, that is the great art of a lifetime, right? I don't want to be the lover today like I was 10 years ago or 20 years ago. I want to every day be a lover in a completely different and new way. You want to remarry Vailana every day. I want to remarry KK every day. Yeah. Right. I, I, we, in other words, in other words, the art sexing is, it's why most married couples stop having sex. The sexing is actually quite, quite difficult. It requires some education and technology, which has been broken because temple consciousness has been and, broken. And, and, and this and, is a whole other That's right. Story and technology, to tell. what you mean by technology, you don't mean technique. Right. 
You mean interior technology. Yep. Where I can be aroused by the rawness of fuck and the rawness of love that are one. And that's the, com, you know, the phenomenology of Eros that, that we're working that's, on. That's what we're working on. Yeah. Oh my God, what a crazy pleasure. What a ride. What a ride. Cha. Mad love to all of you. Have an erotic day. We're going to erotically eat Chef Donnie's food. We are. Let's oh my go. God. Cha. Cha. Thanks for tuning into this video. Make sure you hit subscribe. Follow me at Aubrey Marcus. Check out the Aubrey Marcus podcast available everywhere and leave a comment. Let me know if this video resonated or what else you would like to hear from me in the future. Thank you so much.